everybody and welcome to Bits of Board, where we're talking board games, miniatures, cards and dice. My name's Michael and today it's time to learn how to play John Company, a sandbox, engine management kind of game where players work cooperatively to run an entire industry together, all the while trying to come off as the top player at the end of the game. In a nutshell, players represent different families, with family members stationed throughout various offices within the British East India Company. Players will control the actions of their family, making vital decisions within the company, all the while trying to stimulate the most income at the end of each turn. The catch is that players really aren't there to see the company be profitable, and instead want to see those profits slip into their own coffers, so that when a family member retires, they can afford the finer things in life. This is a Euro game where players share control of one ecosystem. Point scoring opportunities are sporadic and unreliable, and the game does its best to sink you at every available opportunity. It's both elegant and crazy, and it's driven by not just the in-game engines, but also a player's willing to negotiate over the finer details. In short, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Before setup, players will need to choose a scenario to play. Options include a number of scenarios focusing on different gameplay aspects and complexity, and include an introductory scenario, which will help us learn the game without drowning in the details. This is the early company scenario, but once players are familiar enough with this and the extended gameplay, they should be more than comfortable to try the others, as they largely use the same gameplay with probably just a different focus. In this video, I'm just going to go through the early campaign scenario stuff, but I will tack on an extra video to capture all the extended gameplay. For now, let's begin by setting up the play area. Start by placing the board. Here we can see all the different positions in the company players can utilize throughout their playthrough. What they do specifically though, we'll cover after setup. Below the board, we're going to be placing six prize cards representing scoring opportunities available this game. These grant victory points and special abilities to families able to buy in and are the primary method for scoring victory points over the course of the game. Theme-wise, these represent retirement activities once your office holders are retired from the company. Next, shuffle the evening post deck and place on the board in its space. In this particular scenario, we're going to exclude the Monopoly Revoked and Revoke Monopoly cards, returning them to the game box. These relate to some of the more advanced scenarios, which we'll cover in the next teach. Continuing setup, let's place some status marker cubes. We'll place one in the four space on the share price track, one on the one space of the game turn track, one on the zero space of the revenue track, one on the center space of the balance of India track on equilibrium, and finally we'll place one in the picture of parliament in the bottom right hand corner. This will be used to determine the outcome of votes. We're now going to set up a number of tokens and the starting supply somewhere within reach of all players. We'll begin by creating our supply of black discs, placing just one right now, covering the office holder slot of the China office. This indicates its vacancy cannot yet be filled. Next, we create a supply of ships, placing two on each presidency and six in the shipyard. We then create a supply of goods, with 10 on the goods slots in the factory resource box. And then we place a supply of money with five pounds placed on each office featuring the treasury icon. These are the offices that can actually spend money. White tokens are one pound, red tokens are three pounds, and blue are 10. We place our supply of dice. And then lastly, we place our regions based on the setup requirements for the scenario. For our early scenario, we're going to place three open regions along the top of the board. Bengal, above the Bengal Presidency, placed on its prosperous side. Madras, above the Madras Presidency, on its depressed side. And then finally, Bombay, above the Bombay Presidency, on its depressed side. The rest we're going to place off to the side as closed regions in the following configuration. 
Maratha will be placed on its prosperous side, with Sindh dominating it on its depressed side. Punjab will be in turn placed dominating Sindh. The final two regions, Hyderabad and Mysore, will be placed on their own on their prosperous sides. All that's left now is to place the elephant, which in this scenario begins on Punjab. Oh, and of course we've still got some extra cards, but these won't be needed just yet, so keep them off to the side. We now move on to our player setup. Give each player a family card and have them place it family side face up. Noting here that families have special rules, which will make more sense once you know how to play the game. But everything's resolved as written. Give each player five pounds and then cubes of a chosen player color with the number depending on the player count. For our four player game, each player will be given six, placing them above their player card. Then for all players, 12 more will be given, placed below the player card, forming the player's stock. With all remaining cubes returned to the box. Next, it's time for players to populate the board. Here with a random start player going clockwise, we'll take turns placing of their six starting cubes, one on any available vacancy on the board. These are the silver S officers or any of the gold E executive officers. These represent the officers that our players will be responsible for over the first turn of the game. Once everyone has placed their first cube, players place again in reverse order, repeating the process until all spaces are filled. Now, whenever a player places a cube in one of the executive offices, the player must also place one of their starting cubes in the court of directors. These represent a player's share in the company and will determine how much money a player gains when the company dividends are paid. Now, for your first game, if players just want to get into the game and experience the action without too much prep, players can simply place cubes in a random order along the track. With eight spaces and four players, each player will place two cubes when selecting officers. Randomize the cubes and lay them down in order from start all the way through. And it honestly takes a lot of decision making and stress out of learning that first game. Sure, the game might not be totally balanced for setup, but sometimes it's important to see the game in action before committing to strategy. Anyway, once all vacant positions are filled, players will then place their remaining start cubes. For each one, players will roll a dice and place the cube in the relevant resource box. A result of a one has a player place a cube in the court of directors. Should a player roll a two, they place a cube as a mana. A three will get a cube into the shipyard. A four will get a player factory. A five will get a player an officer. And a six will get a player a captain. Now, what all of these mean, I will cover in a sec, but first a couple of notes. For each cube placed on an officer or captain resource box, players must also place a cube in the writer's resource box as well. This cube though is not taken from a player's start cubes and instead placed from their stock. And second, for each cube randomly placed in the court of directors via dice, the chairman must allocate four pounds as they see fit across the office treasuries. These will help pay for actions in the office which they are placed. All right, so we're almost good to go. Let me deal with the remainder of these start tokens. All right, and with that, we're all set up and ready to learn a little bit more about the game. There are a number of key concepts that players should probably be aware of before they start, but to me, details of these makes much more sense as they're described in the context of gameplay. So we'll cover them as full as we go through. All I think you need to know for now is that, well, the company's main goal is to make money. That money is most commonly brought into the company through trade with India. India is represented by region cards, and these region cards are set up in a way to show their economic status, political status, and trade status. Let's have a look how. Economic status represents whether the region is prosperous or it is depressed. Each side changing the cards trade options, actions, and statistics, defense, plunder, and tax. 
A card's political status represents whether a region is sovereign, its colored sovereign events are visible, or whether it is dominated with another region covering those sovereign events up. Regions of India can be dominated by other regions of India, or even the company itself. Depending on a region's political status, it will resolve different kinds of events when visited by the elephant during the evening poster phase. If a region is dominated by the company, it becomes a part of the presidency. If however it's dominated by another region, it and its dominator are collectively referred to as an empire, with each card in the empire referred to as a dominion. Useful later, but maybe too much now. <laughs> Finally, we have a region's trade status, which represents whether the region is open or closed to trade. If the region is open, it sits above a presidency. And if it's closed, it sits off to the left of the board. Now, the general stability of India as a whole is represented by the balance of India track. It exists in either order, equilibrium, or chaos. At the end of each turn, an evening postcard will be drawn, resolution of which will cause the elephant token to move and events to occur in regions through which it passes and finally lands. In resolving these events, if the balance of India is order, we roll two dice, resolving the lowest numbered event. If it's equilibrium, we simply roll one dice. And then if it's chaos, we again roll two dice, but resolve the highest number. Largely, low number of events are more positive, and high number of events cause a region to deteriorate. And what this means to the company is really a loss of potential income. We don't really care about the state of the world otherwise, it's just the money. For this game, money can be in one of two places in John Company, either in a player's family treasury, or in an office treasury on the board. A player will gain money into their family treasury during the trade phase, but Money is not actually scored at the end of the game, so why is it so important? Well, it's integral for the purchase of prizes. When a player would remove an office holder through attrition or other events that we'll note, they are given the opportunity to place the removed cube on a prize card, just so long as they're willing to pay the costs. Players can only enter a card through the position that they left, and will gain the indicated number of victory points at end of game. Aside from victory points, some cards also have special powers as well, which will be resolved as written. Along with prize cards, there's sort of only two other ways to earn victory points. Players will gain two victory points for each mana they've purchased over the course of the game, and one victory point per share they have at the end of the game. Now, Try not to count these chickens before they hatch, as placed cubes are not always permanent, but that really depends on how you manage your cubes. Which brings us to our very last point before we can get into the gameplay, and that is the key concept of negotiation. Over the course of the game, players are free to discuss the game and negotiate their actions between the other players. To sweeten any deals, players may hand over any amount of money player-owned ships, cubes from their stock, which are known as promises, and other players' promises already taken. Now, promises might seem like a great or meaningless idea, but they actually mean quite a lot for endgame scoring. At the end of the game, players will lose two victory points for each of their promises held by another player. Now, it's not all bad, still hand those promises out, because your promises can be returned at any time. You simply have to pay the promise holder £2, show hiring preference when promoting officers or writers, or if you secure one of your opponent's promises, they're simply exchanged. Right, so that's it for negotiation. There are two other items that can be traded, family-owned goods and firm shares, but these only apply outside the early campaign scenario, so we'll cover them next vid. Right, so with all that understood, you're actually now ready to play the game. One of my absolute favourite things about John Company is that you don't need to know much before playing. It helps, obviously, but you can seriously sit people down to this game already set up, and by all accounts, players will learn just about everything they need to know by the end of the second turn of play. You just kind of need someone to explain what the actions are when you get to them. And that's why you're here, right? So, let's go. 
Every turn of the game consists of four phases. The family phase, the company phase, the trade phase, and the evening post phase. We start with the family phase. Beginning with the player controlling the chairman and moving clockwise, each player takes one family action. This involves placing one or more cubes into one of the family actions surrounding the play area. These are the ones that we populated during setup. Basically, we're going to be seeding the industry that supports our machine. There are seven family actions available. Taking a share requires a player to pay an amount of money equal to the current share price. Money spent is given to the chairman and is immediately distributed amongst their chosen company treasuries. Taking a mana action requires a player to pay five pounds, allowing them to place a cube as a mana, potentially scoring two points at endgame. Taking a shipyard action requires a player to pay three pounds and allows them to place a cube into a vacant space with six slots needing to be filled before their five slots. Later in the game, shipyards will make purchasing ships cheaper for the company, with ships used to facilitate trade with India. Even better, should the shipyard's ship be purchased, players will receive one pound for each shipyard they've built beneath it. Taking a factory action works the same as a shipyard. A player spends three pounds and places one of their cubes into a vacant space along the track. Factories reduce the cost of goods purchased by the company and are used in trade or war if they're converted into guns. These also offer a modest revenue stream to players whose goods are purchased, with players receiving the total price paid into their bank. Working out prices though we'll cover a little later. Finally, taking either a captain, officer, or writer action allows a player to place new family members, which can be promoted into the military or an office of the company. Captains pilot ships, generating a slight income. Officers gain plunder when campaigning across regions of India and can be promoted into provincial officers. And writers can be promoted into provincial or purchasing officers. Taking a family action is pretty much mandatory, so here we should mention that if ever a player should need to place a cube and they do not have one, they must still try to take an action, instead using a cube from either a prize card or the mana family action box. If they have none of these, they're considered to already have too many family members in the company and only then are excused from the action. Next, we have the company phase, which is where each player will make the bulk of decisions about how the company is run. We would normally begin here by filling vacancies, but on the first turn of the game, there will be no vacancies, with each office already containing an officer. When hiring is resolved, though, players will fill vacancies in order along the blue ribbon. Let's say we have two vacancies, our chairman and director of trade. If the chairman office is vacant, the previous chairman nominates a player from amongst those with a cube in the court of directors, and then going clockwise, each player votes whether they support the nomination or not. If a nominee receives more than 50% of the vote, they are elected and move their cube from the court into the chairman office. If their nominee doesn't make it through though, the next player proposes a nominee and the process continues until a nominee is elected or until all nominees are shut down. If no nominees are selected in this process, the previous chairman decides from the failed candidates. Moving on, executive offices are filled by the chairman who promotes an office holder from an existing senior office. If there were none, however, the chairman would choose a writer from the pool. We continue along the blue ribbon, quickly stopping at our presidencies, because it is possible for presidencies to have their own provincial offices to fill at this stage. And it's here that the related president will make the choice, choosing any writer or an officer in an army to take the position. Continuing all the way along, all that's left is to fill our purchasing offices. These are filled by the current director of trade, promoting any writer into the office. Now, a quick word on nepotism here. This is a word encompassing the promotion of family over another more fitting candidate. If a player were to promote a cube of their colour over another player's cube, they must pay one promise to each player with at least one cube in the pool. 
And just a quick reminder, if they decide to promote someone else above one of their workers, they can take one of their promise cubes back from the player promoted. That said though, this isn't really something you need to worry about on the first turn, so let's begin our look at each office in detail, resolving one full turn of the game. Here we begin resolving each office's actions in order along the red ribbon. We begin at the ship's purchasing office. This one here has only one green action, the purchase action. Here, players must purchase as many ships as their office can afford, spending money to the bank from the office treasury. Each ship costs the highest amount of money visible underneath it, with a player having to purchase the cheapest options first. Any players with cubes underneath the purchased ships will gain one pound for each cube, adding any money gained into their family treasury. The purchased ships are then transported to the Director of Trade for distribution when their office activates. Goods purchasing is the second office, and this one only contains one type of action. Again, it's the purchase action. Here, like ships purchasing, players must purchase as many goods this time as their office can afford. However, the price of the goods is not set in stone. If a particular good has a factory, the price is that listed on the current evening postcard. As we don't have any evening postcards in play yet, the price is just going to be £2 each. All goods must be purchased cheapest first, with the entirety of the payment going to the player if they have a warehouse cube beneath it. If not though, the payment is £3 and made to the bank. Like the shipyard, all purchased goods are sent to the Director of Trade. Now these two purchase actions are a great example of where negotiation in John Company will come into play. Should the ship's purchasing or goods purchasing officer have multiple options available for which ships and goods are purchased, other players may like to influence their decisions with money, promises, or whatever. These are just some small examples, but remember negotiations can be made around just about everything. Now back to the goods purchasing action for a sec, there are some instances where the current evening postcard shows a red X in the corner rather than a value. This means goods cannot be purchased from factory locations and instead only those without cubes beneath them. Military affairs is the third office and this contains two types of action. We have a purchase action for goods, which is resolved same as previous, except goods are kept in the office instead of being sent to the Director of Trade. The reason? Well, they have their own logistics action, which means they get to decide where the goods are sent. This second action, logistics, moves goods sending them to Presidency Armies. Here we have to note that goods transferred this way are no longer referred to as goods and are instead referred to as guns for use in campaign actions or defensive actions. Now, a couple of other things to note here. First, during this action, the military affairs officer may freely transfer guns between presidencies, so long as they have the owning player's permission to do so. And second, well, this action actually handles a second type of resource, officers, noting that right now, there's none currently present in the office to move. If they were, any officers present in the military affairs office are sent to populate the armies within each presidency. There is one additional rule that should officers be brought in and one army already has three officers, one of those officers must be replaced by one of the incoming officers. Next, we have the director of trade who also has a logistics action. Except this time, well, theirs is a little more in depth. Here we'll have goods, ships, and captains to deal with. First, the Director of Trade would deal with the captains, but much like the officers, these captains aren't available in the office just yet, so would be skipped first round. That said though, the Director of Trade will, in any order they choose, offer each captain the opportunity to purchase a ship from the shipyard's supply. And if they do, they pay the cost, and then take a ship and place it in a presidency with their captain cube on top. If a captain would decline or there are no ships available, the captains are instead returned to their player's supply. 
after dealing with them, the director of trade will begin to distribute their ships and goods amongst the presidencies, noting here that unlike the military affairs officer, goods transferred remain goods and are not sent to armies as guns. During this action, the Director of Trade is also freely able to transfer ships and goods between presidencies, so long as they have the owning player's permission. Right, so moving on from the Director of Trade, we're now going to encounter three different presidencies with access to the regions of India. Despite their different regions available, these will all be resolved the same way, each with three optional actions to utilise. Campaign, Open Trade, and Sale. These actions are unlike any of the previous, in that each action will require a player to pass a check for the action to be considered a success. To do this, players roll a number of dice, equal to the action's strength, minus any penalties incurred. The dice are rolled, and the lowest result is counted. A 1 or a 2 indicate a success, and the action is completed. A 3 or a 4 indicate no result, and a 5 or a 6 indicate a failure, whereby the office holder is removed and returned to their player's supply, at which point no more actions can be completed. Now, the number of dice rolled indicates a certain probability of success, and so players don't have to work it out for themselves, they've actually included a handy chart on the back of the rulebook outlining the odds. One dice, the odds of a success are 33%. Two dice, the odds of a success are 55% and so on. Right, so each presidency has three actions to go through. Campaign, open trade and sale. These can be taken any number of times, but the actions must be taken in order. The campaign action is used to dominate new regions, expanding the company's influence across India. The player chooses a target listed next to the campaign action icon and begins resolving a check. To gain strength, players will need to exhaust officers and guns in their army, each granting one point of strength. If a player is not confident they have enough strength for the campaign, they may hire mercenaries which increase strength by one, for each hired at two pounds apiece. For the purpose of this example, let's go all in. We've exhausted one gun, giving us one point of strength, and then with five dollars left, we could go ahead and hire two mercenaries for a grand total of three. We now subtract the penalty, which is in this case the defense of the region. Bombay has one, so we're going to be rolling two dice. Looking at our odds, this is a 55% chance of success. Let's see how we go. And we actually make it. Cool. The five doesn't count as we use only the lowest number and the one gets us our success. In this case, the campaign allows us to put down the governor of Bombay, dominating the region. After campaigning, we'd move on to open trade and then sail. But for right now, we're going to leave it there, moving on to our next presidency. In the presidency of Madras, we're going to be showing off the second action available in presidencies, the open trade action, which is used to open up trade to closed regions. In this case, we're going to try and open up Hyderabad. To resolve this action's check, players spend money and for each pound spent, gain one strength for the test with no penalties. I reckon we should go all in here and spend four of our five pounds to gain an 80% success. We roll four dice, knocking them across the board, but we already have our success. Beautiful. Hyderabad is added to the presidency and we clean up some scattered ships. The final action is the sale action, and it's here that players may attempt to fulfill orders on any regions open to trade in their presidency. To do so, players will need to send a combination of boats or goods to regions to fulfil their trade requirements. Now, because we've left the Madras Presidency with very little money, let's move on to the Bengal Presidency to show it off there. To resolve this action, players again gain strength for every pound spent, but this time are penalised in their test based on the number of regions in the Presidency, minus one. In this case, Bengal is the only region within the presidency, so we will have no penalties. Let's shoot for another 80% success rate, grab our four dice, 
and give it a roll. And what do you know, we've passed without twos there. If successful, players may begin filling orders listed on the region card. Here they will exhaust a number of ships and goods present, equal to the requirements of the orders being fulfilled. Any number of ships can be sent, but the total number of goods may never be more than the total number of ships. Once this is done, the player increases the company revenue based on the goods traded. Indigo gives six points and Silk another six. Just like that, we have 12 pounds in company revenue. Now that is all the main actions covered. We would move through and activate the China trade office, but that is not unlocked at the beginning of this game. This action simply gives us a sale option where we can sell tea or opium, just as if we were selling from a presidency to a region. Now, one last thing before we move on to the trade action is an action that is actually available all the way throughout the company phase. This is the debt action. This action may be taken once by the chairman at any time during the turn and will allocate five pounds across the company treasury as they see fit. Just as an example here, we could have done this after the Madras presidency completed their open trade action to give us the ability to sail to our newly opened Hyderabad. The catch with this action though is that it causes a black disc to be placed in the court of directors, reducing available revenue during the trade phase. It's only one pound per disc, which is actually not that bad in a standard length game, in some cases actually granting more money than it takes away, but it's probably a different story for the campaign length game. Point is, don't be afraid of this action. Debt is actually a pretty great way to inject cash into actions when and where it's needed. That said, we've come to the end of the Red Ribbon. It's time to move on to phase three, the trade phase. This is where players will generate their personal savings and where the company will spend and allocate its accumulated revenue. We begin with player revenue. First, taxes. Here we'll place money from dominated regions throughout the presidencies with the amount equal to the tax value of the region. Now, at this point, if there were a player present in the office, they may choose to, instead of leaving that money in the company treasury, take it into their family treasury. It just depends on what their long-term plan is. Next is presidential bonuses, which grant presidents money equal to the number of fulfilled orders on each region in their presidency. Here, the Bengal president has two fulfilled orders, so the blue player gains two. Interlopers are next, granting two pounds for each captain a player has with a ship. And then finally, there are other revenue options made available through prizes taken or family powers. For now though, that is it for player revenue. We move on to company expenses. Here, the chairman uses revenue gained over the course of the turn to cover costs of the company. First, money is paid to the bank. Firstly, one pound for each black disc in the court of directors accumulated through debt, one pound for each gun and officer in each presidency, and then one pound for each captain on a ship. Then, if we had any angry shareholders, we would need to pay dividends from the company revenue to appease them. But right now, we're okay. In fact, the only way we could get to angry shareholders is if we didn't pay dividends, which is something we're gonna talk about in just a sec. Before we do that though, we first need to cover the possibility that our company may not have made enough money to cover its own costs as detailed. Let's say three players had ships and we had only two points left in company revenue. Here, the chairman must take an emergency loan to raise the money required. Now, this is pretty much the same as a debt action with the company gaining a black marker and gaining five pounds to spend as needed. So here, the chairman would pay three to cover the costs of the ship captains, and then the remaining two would be placed as they see fit across any of the office treasuries. Now, there are a couple of quick notes here. These black markers are, of course, debts, but these don't need to be paid this turn. And there is no limit to the number of emergency loans that can be taken here, so long as they go to paying for company expenses. 
So our company has paid all its expenses and hopefully at this point we still have some money in revenue. It's here that the chairman will now have to decide what to do with it. There are two options. The chairman can pay any amount of company revenue across the company's treasuries or they can pay it out through dividends to company shareholders. Here the chairman will reduce the revenue equal to the number of cubes in the share or court of directors box. Here we have six, so we go from 10 to four. Next, each player with a cube in the court of directors would receive one pound per cube they have as dividends. And this is one of the few ways that players can actually milk the company for cash. The chairman may decide to pay dividends as many times as they can afford, and if they pay more than once, the share price increases by one. In this case, we can only afford to pay it once, and so our remaining four pounds would need to be distributed amongst the office treasuries. Now, if our chairman had decided not to pay out any share prices, the share price would drop. And it's when the company reaches a share price of three that angry shareholders come into play. So with all that said, what if we begin the trade phase with a share price of three and have angry shareholders? What if we're unable to pay out the dividends to appease them? It's not something that can happen on the first term, I don't think, but I'm going to touch on it here anyways. Basically, dividends cannot be paid with emergency loans, so instead there's a bailout. To resolve a bailout, players with only one cube in the court of directors have their cube returned to their supply. And then players with more than one cubes remove all but one. If there's still cubes left in the court, all executive officers are removed from their offices and should they be willing to pay an additional two pounds for the privilege, will be able to buy into prizes for scoring at the end of the game. It's basically attrition, but more expensive. If, on the other hand, no cubes were left in the court of directors, executive officers are not removed, and the game is over, with all players losing three points for each cube they have in an executive office space. Right, so that is the trade phase done and dusted, and I know it's a little bit much for the first turn, but it's really kind of good to know just what game systems you're actually going up against here. With that done, we move on from the trade phase, with all that's left for us to check out, being the evening post phase. In this final phase of the turn, players will reveal and resolve the top card of the evening post deck, completing three sets of actions. We have the events in India, attrition rolls, and then the local news, either a domestic effect or a proposed law. The first one is events in India, which causes movement of the elephant token. Here, the elephant token moves a number of regions as stated on the card, and for each region the elephant passes through or ends on, dice are rolled to determine an event. The elephant moves from region 1 to 2 to 3, all the way up to 8, and then after 8 returns to 1. So here our elephant is going to begin in Punjab, and for its first move, move to Maratha. To resolve an event, a number of dice are rolled with the number dependent on the balance of India. Like I said earlier, if it's in order, we roll two dice, pick the lowest. If it's in equilibrium, we roll one dice. And if it's in chaos, we roll two dice again, but pick the highest result. We're in equilibrium at the moment, so we roll just the one. Maratha being dominated, we will resolve a revolt action. Now, one thing to be aware of throughout resolution of events is the prospect of disrupted orders. This will be called out specifically for some of the following events, but will always occur when an open region becomes closed. Here, should a region having completed trade discs ever suffer an event causing it to be disrupted, its presidency must return to the supply a number of ships equal to the number of trade discs present on the card. That is ships from the exhausted supply or the presidency supply. That in mind, the kinds of events are as follows. Firstly, conquests, and this, this is the big one. Here, the active region attempts to conquer and dominate the region listed alongside the event. Here, Mysore is gonna go after Hyderabad. Now, if the region had already dominated it and the result was rolled, we would then resolve the next one down, in this case Madras. 
If all options are exhausted and they're already dominated as a part of their empire, the conquest does not take place and the balance of India shifts to order. If the region does have a valid target though, we resolve the conquest comparing the region's strength, the number next to the cannon, to the region's defence. If it's less, nothing happens, but if it's greater, the target becomes dominated. Now that's the basics, but there are a few special points to note here. Firstly, things get a little bit more complicated when the targeted region is actually already part of an empire. Here, to determine that region's defence, we add up the defence value of all of its dominions, making it a lot harder to dominate. If, however, a conquest is successful, the target region instead becomes dominated by the active region. Now, in our game here, Mysore has just moved Hyderabad from being an open region to a closed region, so we would need to check for disruption. Next, we're specifically going to look at conquests made against the sovereign of an empire. Here, if a conquest is successful, the target region is dominated, and all those previously dominated by the region actually split off, becoming sovereign on their own and moving to the closed side of the board. Again, this can move from open to closed, so check for disruption. Next, we're going to look at conquests against a region within a presidency. So we're going to sort of rewind and look at how our original Hyderabad example is going to take place, because it's not just out there in the middle of the ocean, it's part of a presidency. Here, the defence value on the card is actually ignored, and instead defence must be raised by its associated president. Here they would have to exhaust officers and guns, gaining one point of defence each. Now, in some cases, presidents won't be able to exhaust enough resources to meet the defence, so they are actually allowed to purchase mercenaries again, raising one point of defence for each one purchased at two pounds each. If, however, the conquest is successful, the region becomes dominated, and of course we check for disruption. The last example that we're going to look at is conquests made against a region already dominated by a presidency. Mysore here is going after Bombay with a strength of three, but from our example turn we can see that Bombay is already dominated by the company. Here, defence is calculated the same way as any other region in a presidency, except the consequences of failure are much more dire. Here, if the conquest is successful, the region is dominated as usual, except a black disc is placed above the provincial office. The office, and any office holder present, will be eliminated from the game during resolution of attrition coming up soon. Oh, yeah, and check for disruption. Now, these are all the cases that we could come up against through resolution of a conquest, but there are still two things that we need to note. First, should a presidency ever have no regions above it? The office will be eliminated during attrition. Second, after a successful conquest and the elephant still has to move, instead of following its usual path, it will be moved to the lowest numbered sovereign region, not including this one. The next event is flips, and this causes a region to flip to its opposite side. If the region is flipped to its depressed side, orders are disrupted, and if it flips to its prosperous side, balance of India tilts towards order. We move our elephant a third time, landing on Mysore. I know this is a different setup, but I need it like this so I can show off the next action, revolt. Revolt cause a region to become sovereign and closed. If this would occur to a region dominated by the company, just as in a conquest, the region would be eliminated next turn unless its office holder is able to cancel the revolt through use of police. To do this, a player would need to equal the results of the event dice with the strength of its police. Police are powered one point for each gun the player exhausts and one point for every two pounds spent. If the revolt cannot be prevented, the presidency is eliminated, the balance of India shifts towards chaos, and if the elephant still has events to resolve, it, instead of following its usual path, moves to the lowest numbered, this time dominated, region, if possible. The next type of event is 
collapse, which causes completed orders to be disrupted and the balance of India to tilt towards chaos. And finally, status quo causes no bad effects and pushes the balance of India towards order. So after all events in India are completed, we move on to attrition rolls. Here, if directed on the evening postcard, players will roll for attrition for each office holder on the board in order following the blue ribbon. Chairman will roll first, vacating on a four plus. Then executive officers will roll, vacating on a five plus. And then senior officers will roll, vacating on a six. Worth noting that while not all evening postcards call for attrition, it is the vast majority. Should any office holder be removed, shift them up off their space. Once all attrition rolls have been made, go along the blue ribbon again, this time with each removed cube, making a decision whether or not to purchase one prize matching their rank. Like I've said previously, this is the main way for players to gain victory points in John Company. And here it's kind of a case of if you can afford them, get them because attrition and thus these points are not always guaranteed. It's the roll of a dice after all. Now, before we move off to the local news and the refresh phase, we've still potentially got office holders with black discs to resolve. These guys during attrition do not actually roll and are automatically given a six, meaning they need to vacate. The only difference between these guys and a normal attrition roll is that they're required to pay two pounds more to score chosen prizes. That's not all though, all ships, goods, officers, captains, guns, and money in their offices are immediately discarded and returned to the supply. And with that done, a black disc is placed over the office, showing that the position can never be filled again. Moving on, local news is next. Here, players will resolve either a domestic event, a one-time effect resolved as written, or a proposed law, which if voted in, will go on to change the rules of the game going forward. Like I said, domestic events just resolve, but laws need to be voted in by the players. The vote begins with zero support, and then players beginning with the chairman and going clockwise will cast their vote on a law either for or against. This vote will either increase or decrease the law's approval rating based on a player's political power the sum total of shipyards and factories a player holds, and also any money they would wish to spend in the process. Here it's worth noting that after a player's vote, a proposal can never go below minus 10 approval or positive 10 approval. So don't go wasting that money. If after voting, the approval rating is greater than zero, the law takes effect and will be in play until the end of the game. And that resolved, the evening postcard is complete. So now all that's left is to refresh for the next turn. First, remove black discs from completed orders, return exhausted ships to the presidency and exhausted goods to the supply, return exhausted guns and officers to their standby position, move cubes in the captain's resource box to the director of trade office, Move cubes in the officer resource box to the military affairs office, refill the ships in the shipyards and goods in their warehouses, and then finally advance the game turn marker one space. In a normal game, it is game over after the sixth round, whereby players will score points based on prizes gained, plus one for each share cube and two for each mana. Players will lose two victory points for every promise kept by another player, with scores totaled and the player with the most victory points taking the win. Ties are broken with the most prize cubes, and if there's still a tie, it goes to the player with the most money. Game over can also occur, as I mentioned earlier, in company failure if there are no shares present in the court of directors after a bailout. But there is one other way in the base game that the game can end, and that is if there is a mutiny. This occurs if after the third game turn, seven or more regions are closed after the refresh. If the game ends through company failure, each player's executive cubes subtract three points from their score, and in a mutiny, it's just the chairman that loses three points. And that's pretty much it, guys and gals. 
I mean, that's pretty much it for the basic game. Like I said earlier, there's still one final section to teach, and that is the expanded game, where we bring in the extended family phase. Now, this is a planned shift in gameplay and can only occur through a campaign game or as a feature in one of the other scenarios. So you kind of have to choose for it to be an option, but still, it's not always a guarantee. It alters a few in-game rules and adds this entirely new level of gameplay, which brings just so much new stuff to consider. All that though, is the next video, guys and gals. I gotta split this one in two because I feel like this is enough for the moment. Stay tuned for the second part of this one though, coming as soon as I can film it. And after that, the world of John Company will be yours for the exploring. If you've enjoyed the video, make sure you like, comment and subscribe, especially if you wanna see how deep the rabbit hole goes on this one. But till then, my name's Michael, this is Bits Aboard, we'll catch you next time.